This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Glendale, California. A bookkeeper dies during a late night visit to a doctor's office, apparently of a heart attack. Within weeks, investigators begin to unravel an intriguing tale of multiple identities, insurance fraud, and murder. In Montana, the century-old legend of a lost treasure. Some believe the state's most vicious highwayman, a sheriff turned outlaw, buried $6 million in gold in the rugged mountains. Lake Michigan. In 1985, a wealthy investor named Woody Kelly went out for a boat cruise. A few hours later, his yacht was found adrift and empty. No trace of Woody Kelly has ever been found. Also tonight, the poignant story of a woman's search for her missing half-brother and sister. Today, Leanne Robinson wants to reunite with the only family she's ever known, a family she's not seen for 18 years. Maybe with your help, she will. Join me. You may be able to help solve a mystery. The oath is a solemn pledge that represents the highest ideals of the medical profession. In essence, it places the good of the patient above all other concerns. In Glendale, California, police suspect that a physician named Richard Boggs may have betrayed this oath in the most shocking way imaginable. Boggs is currently in jail, charged with being one of the ringleaders of a complex plot that has led police on the bewildering trail of conspiracies, false identities, and murder. It all began on the early morning of April 16, 1988. Just before 7.10 a.m., paramedics responded to an emergency call at the Glendale, California medical office of Richard Boggs. Inside, they discovered a man lying on the floor of an examining room. Boggs identified him as Melvin Eugene Hansen. Boggs says that he received a phone call from one of his patients, a long-term patient, Melvin Eugene Hansen. The man said he'd been drinking heavily, he was having chest pains, and he wanted to come in and be examined. Boggs said that he had treated Hansen for seven years and that his patient had recently complained of heart trouble. Boggs claimed Hansen had asked to meet him at his office at five in the morning for an EKG and other medical tests. He brought Hansen in, examined him, left him in a treatment room by himself to rest for a few minutes. I really don't think you have any need for alarm. Now, why don't you just lie down here for a few minutes, and I'll be right back. And Boggs went into another room to sort through things while he was waiting for Hanson to rest when he heard a thud. Boggs said he rushed back, only to find Hanson lying unconscious. Boggs then claimed that he immediately called the 911 number, but found it busy. Boggs said he tried to revive Hanson for 30 minutes, and at 7.04, he finally got through on the 911 line. Finally, paramedics arrived. He, the body was pronounced dead at the scene. And originally, it was just a normal death, just a natural death in a doctor's office with a doctor in attendance. I mean, that makes it just a routine death, and the majority of deaths in this county are in the attendance of a physician. Pupils are fixed and dilated. What kind of history? Cardiovascular problems and when paramedics examined the body in Boggs's office, they noticed that his condition seemed inconsistent with the doctor's story. He's got some rigor in his neck, in his jaw. The body's rigor mortis suggested that death had occurred significantly earlier than Boggs was claiming. In fact, the EKG tape revealed that the machine had last been used just after midnight, not 5 a.m. How long do you say he's been down? Suspicious, paramedics called the police. 
You thought your patient was having a heart attack, but you didn't call an ambulance. You were going to treat him at your facility? Yes, because he trusted me, and uh, uh, believe me, it's hard enough to even get him to come in for his regular checkups. So I, Dr. Box ignored basic life-saving protocol. A doctor is not going to try and help a heart attack patient in his office. He's going to have an ambulance waiting for him. Dr. Boss, can you tell me a little more about the 911 call? Are, are you sure you dialed 911? Yes, I'm certain, and uh, I got no response there. His uh, comments regarding the 911 bothered me. He had told us he had gotten a busy signal. Uh, that time in the morning, uh, I found it hard to believe that he'd get a busy signal on a 911 system. That time of morning. Though three credit cards and a copy of a birth certificate were discovered in Hanson's wallet, no ID with a photograph of Hanson was found. Boggs gave police the name of Hanson's business partner as an emergency contact. John Hawkins, Columbus, Ohio. H-A-W-K-I-N-S. Police were reluctant to further question Boggs without more evidence, as he had once been one of the most respected physicians in Southern California. By virtue of his skill and hard work, he had built up an extremely lucrative medical practice. But by the 1980s, Boggs had experienced severe personal and financial reverses. There were rumors that he was dangerously overextended, that his practice and medical license were in jeopardy. The most probable cause of death is acute nonspecific myocarditis. On April 17th, when the body found in Boggs's office was autopsied, the pathologist noticed something peculiar. The body is noted to be that of a Caucasian male, appearing to be younger than the stated age of 46. Though the body appeared to be younger than the 46-year-old Hansen's birth certificate had stated, the opportunity to examine it further vanished when Hansen's business partner, John Hawkins, arrived from Ohio. 25-year-old John Hawkins and Melvin Hansen had co-owned a successful clothing store chain. Hawkins made it clear he needed to settle Hansen's affairs quickly in order to return home to his business. What I really need to know is, when is the body going to be cremated? When John Hawkins arrived from Columbus, Ohio, he made arrangements with a local mortuary to have the body cremated. When Hawkins learned that the ashes would not be scattered until a much later time, uh, that being up to a month, uh, he was upset. Business there. I need to expedite this as much as possible. Is there any other way? Hawkins, uh, through the mortuary personnel, uh, located a local scattering service that uh, scattered those ashes the following day. Thanks. Glendale Police Department, officer, you go to Malibu. Two months later, this case took another intriguing turn. On June 9th, a, a detective received a phone call from an insurance company representative who informed him they were about to pay a $1 million life insurance policy for the death of Gene Hansen. The beneficiary of that policy was John Hawkins of Columbus, Ohio. The representative inquired if the photographs of the body had ever been compared to any other known pictures of Melvin Hansen. Up, that, up to that point, uh, that had not occurred. Uh, the detective uh, sent away for a, a California driver's license photo of Melvin Eugene Hansen. Several weeks later, when the photographs arrived, police made a shocking discovery. The man found in Boggs's office was not Melvin Hansen. The detective contacted the insurance representative immediately, and it was too late and that the insurance company had already paid out the $1 million to the beneficiary, John Hawkins. But if the body in Boggs's office was not handsome, then who was it? Police used fingerprints to match the dead body with missing persons reports. The body that Boggs had identified as his patient, Melvin Eugene Hanson, was in fact that of a 32-year-old North Hollywood bookkeeper named Ellis Henry Green. Investigators now wanted to talk with John Hawkins, the man who had ordered Green cremated. Investigators in Columbus, Ohio, followed up on John Hawkins. Uh, they found that he had uh, abandoned the residence that he had lived in and uh, later discovered his convertible Mercedes parked at the airport, top down, keys still in the ignition, uh, indicating an obvious uh, quick exit uh, from that particular area. 
Dr. Boggs, during our investigation, a concern has arisen when the body that you identified as Mr. Hansen may not, in fact, be Mr. Hansen. Now, I'm going to show Despite you... Despite evidence to the contrary, Boggs continued to insist to police that the man found in his office was the man he knew as Melvin Hansen. Right there, the same man I identified to the other officers. Have you ever seen the other man before? Nope. Dr. Boggs later claimed that he'd been duped by this individual who died in his office uh, and demanded to know why this person represented himself as Melvin Hansen. The police were not convinced and issued a search warrant for Boggs's files. A trace of his phone record showed frequent calls to Hansen's business number and more suspiciously to Hansen's partner, John Hawkins. Investigators also noticed that Boggs had received calls from a Wolfgang von Schnoen. In fact, Boggs had spoken with him the same night that Green's body was found. They wanted to know why, and Schnoden's name was distributed to law enforcement agencies around the country. Several months passed. Anything to declare? January 29, 1989, Dallas International Airport. Nine months after Ellis Green was found in Richard Boggs's office, a suspicious acting man was interrogated by customs officials after getting off a flight from Mexico. When his bag was examined, $14,000 in undeclared cash was discovered. Oh, that, I, I closed out a bank account in Mexico. I, I had an account there, and I, you know, I didn't fill out the forms. You know, I'm sorry. Oh! Let me see your bag. Why? Wait, I can... I... When the customs agent searched uh, the man's bags, he discovered uh, not only the identification that he was using at that time, but he also discovered photo identification of the same person with the name of Wolfgang von Schnoden. But the most critical discovery was the original California driver's license for the dead man, Ellis Henry Green. Take off your sunglasses. Why? Take off your sunglasses. The customs agent made a computer inquiry and learned that uh, Wolfgang von Schnoden was, in fact, wanted by authorities. I told it. I'd fill out the form. We'll, I'll put down, you know, we'll figure out. Uh, Wolfgang von what? Snowden is wanted in a murder case. What? We'll hold you till Within a few hours, the man who carried ID as Wolfgang von Schnoden was finally identified by his real name, Melvin Eugene Hansen. If Melvin Eugene Hansen was alive, why had Boggs claimed he had died in his office? In order to answer this question, police began to piece together an alleged conspiracy that they believe had almost resulted in the perfect crime. Do you recognize his phone number at all? Melvin Hansen and John Hawkins were business partners. It is thought that they came up with a scheme of murdering Ellis Green, switching his identity with Hansen's, and then collecting on Hansen's insurance policy. That's not exactly what to get back to Ohio. Like, By ordering that the remains be cremated, the state's proof that Green had been murdered would literally have gone up in smoke. I could offer an agency that could do that for you. Five days after the apprehension of Hanson, Richard Boggs was arrested at his Glendale office. He was charged with insurance fraud and the murder of Ellis Green. What we do know about Ellis Green is that he had a 0.29 alcohol level in his body. That would suggest to, to us that he was lured to the doctor's office. And along with that level of intoxication, a final mechanism of death was inflicted upon him. Because of a doctor's involvement in this case, it has forced us to look into other areas. Drugs, uh, when used in combination with high levels of alcohol, could cause death. Poisons, medications and not to exclude the fact that he may have suffocated him. In a television interview conducted just before his arrest, Richard Boggs stoutly maintained his innocence, saying that there was no evidence he had profited from the plot. At all. I didn't take off uh, with the money as they did. I didn't vanish. I've been here all the time, getting all the heat from uh, what they pulled. Um, and I've benefited uh, absolutely in no way from this little scheme of theirs. Um, you know, um, and to add insult to injury, they didn't even pay the medical bill.
Next, the story of a successful entrepreneur who literally sailed off the face of the earth. Anybody on board? 9.30 p.m., June the 8th, 1985, Lake Michigan. A derelict yacht had been reported drifting just offshore, its occupant apparently in danger. Anybody on board? Police department! Officer Wayne Brooks responded to the call. When I initially got there, I heard the engines running. As I was approaching closer, the engines died. The boat was then just drifting. I was able to pull myself up over the side. I was looking for a victim of a possible heart attack. Police! I police! Anyone on board? I searched the boat, cabin area down below, found nobody on the boat. Police department! But when I arrived, the way the engines were running, if someone had fallen off that boat, it's my opinion they could not have got back onto the boat. Uh, would have been moving away from them too quickly. The owner of the yacht was a 42-year-old investment counselor named Woody Kelly. No sign of Woody or his body has ever been found. In 1975, Woody Kelly and his family settled near Lake Michigan in the small Illinois town of Antioch. At first, the Kellys lived in a modest neighborhood. But after he began an investment business, the family's fortunes began to change. They moved to a mansion near a local lake. By virtue of his business and his outgoing nature, Woody soon became one of the town's most respected personalities. Woody, I feel, was considered by a lot of people as a pillar of the community. He belonged to two very active community organizations, participated a great deal in those organizations. I think that the community enjoyed Woody. They liked him. He just had this genuine personality that he just wanted to talk to him. He was a real likable guy. Woody was a dedicated family man and often invited his new friends and neighbors to his luxurious home. Soon, many of his personal friends became business clients. He became your friend. He'd actually make you want to invest money. God, I wish I had some money I could give him. One of the principal clients of Woody's investment company was veterinarian Daniel Osgood. He seemed very professional. He had a very substantial office, office staff. Here, I like to take and meet Brenda. His reports were very like exacting. He just had all the instruments that promoted Here's, confidence. Over here, we have George, another one of our people. Yeah, we're a growing organization, as you can see. Woody was able to promise and deliver an amazing 16 to 19 percent interest on his investments. He was not pushy at all. Woody was enthusiastic about what he was doing. He did not uh, come on hard sell. He was fairly uh, laid back. He assured me that this was a good investment, that I really should consider it. And he would welcome my business. And they're just wonderful investments. Are they insured? I mean, is this safe? Definitely. To me, I think they're just a, a, a very, very good situation for you to be in. Woody's Sounds business flourished. He bought four luxury cars, two airplanes, three different homes, and six boats. As a hobby, he even started a yacht charter service. Hi, Lita, Randy. How are you? How you been? Good. Woody was known to be extremely generous. He took his friends and investors on lake cruises, and in a few cases, he treated them to expensive vacations. I asked him if he robbed banks for a living, and he just laughed. I mean, we believed in him so much that we were building a restaurant for $350,000, and he was going to be part of it. No questions asked. June the 8th, 1985, Woody unexpectedly showed up at a yacht dealer to check on a new boat he had just purchased. Hey, Dave, how's the boat? Just wrapping up a few of those ends. He you told me he was going to take the boat out. 
So I asked him if he wanted me to go with him for a test drive. Our company policy is that nobody will go for a lake test alone. This is my boat. I'm taking it out. He was very adamant about it. He insisted that, no, I have people waiting for me at the dock. He said, I want to go out alone. So I helped him cast off, and that was the last we seen him. Woody left at approximately 3 p.m. and headed north towards Waukegan, Illinois, about 20 miles away. He had told his family he would be home by 6 o'clock. He never returned. Over the next few days, the Coast Guard retraced Woody's route. As his distinctive sunglasses were found on the boat, they assumed he had accidentally fallen overboard. Because victims of drowning inevitably surfaced, they looked for a body. They found nothing. After this unusual disappearance, the town of Antioch was saddened. But as time passed, sadness turned to shock, and then anger. Evidence appeared showing that Woody Kelly was more than a genial financial wizard, much more. All right, we're going to grab all the business records, all right? I don't want to land anything about it. The same week that Kelly disappeared, a client filed a civil suit charging him with improper business practices. Sheriff, police. After Kelly vanished, Detective Dan Collin from the Lake County Here Sheriff's you. Department became involved in the investigation. Sheriff's office. We have a search warrant for Kelly's business and offices. And if you please show me Mr. Kelly's office. When the office staff began looking at the records, they realized that there was no money in the bank accounts. This was Woody's office. So this is where he kept his private files? Right. The money Such was just being spent. Bank accounts. Every time an investor would right. put money in, it was going right back out. Okay. So, you know, basically immediately looking at the checkbooks, you knew that it was a fraud. When Kelly's records were scrutinized, they showed that the bulk of the investor's money had gone directly into his pocket. Almost $6 million was missing. In 1981, I gave Woody Kelly $110,000 to invest for me. I have never recovered one cent. My husband and I invested our money with Woody after we sold our home. And we invested, I estimate, about $30,000. My investment with Woody Kelly was in excess of $400,000, and the entire sum was eventually lost. Woody's investment company took in everybody, whether it was a blue-collar worker, a white-collar worker. He included everybody. He had firemen, you had school teachers, you had doctors, you had lawyers. Woody was non-segregational. He took everybody. <laughs> what happened to Woody Kelly? Some believe that he had been murdered by a former partner in crime. Another persistent rumor was that an accomplice had picked him up by boat or seaplane. If he did fake his disappearance, police still have no idea how he escaped detection. Over the years, we keep getting phone calls. You know, someone supposedly saw him down in Rio de Janeiro. Um, we get, you know, inferences that he's down in the islands. Um, a solid lead to say, you know, this is where Woody is at. I have never gotten one. When we interviewed some of the investors, we had people that we talked to that said, if he walked in the door, and he asked them for $10, they give it to him, even though they just lost thousands, because he was so likable. You know, he was a good salesman. He was a good con man. Today, Woody Kelly would be 46 years old. He is 5 feet 11 inches in height and weighs 200 pounds. His eyes are blue, and at the time of his disappearance, his hair was brown. At the present time, he may be wearing a beard. These are home movies taken of Woody Kelly the same year he disappeared. In 
a moment, the story of a fortune in stolen gold, which has remained hidden in the rugged hills of Montana for more than a century. Our next mystery is a tale of legendary treasure, buried, we've been told, somewhere in the hills of Montana. 126 years ago, a crooked sheriff and his outlaw gang went to the gallows, refusing to reveal the exact location of their hidden booty. To this day, the tantalizing lure of buried gold still attracts prospectors. It all began in the summer of 1863, during what would prove to be the bloodiest period in Montana history. The Montana Territory, 26 years before Montana would be admitted to the Union, when gold was discovered in a part of the territory known as Alder Gulch, hundreds of prospectors showed up, each trying to claim his share of the spoils. News of any gold discovery in those days spread fast and spread far and wide. Holy Moses, look at this, look right at me. Riches were being made and people wanted to get in on them. That's why there was such a large gang of outlaws around every mining camp. Hey, fellas, we got company. What can we do for you guys? In the spring of 1863, the Montana prospectors were nearly wiped out by a brazen group of outlaws called the Road Agent Gang. The road agents reportedly stole more than 1,000 hey, pounds of gold and nuggets, coins, and gold dust. They were secretly led by a man named Henry Plummer. But amazingly, Plummer had another identity, sheriff of the gold boom town of Bannock, Montana. The people who elected him had no way of knowing that Henry Plummer was an ex-convict. Ironically, he had been released just four years earlier from a brand new California prison, San Quentin. Henry Plummer was a very pleasant looking individual. He was the only man in Bannock, practically, that always tipped his hat to a lady when he saw her on the street. Well, you could call him the consummate con man of his day. So he was able to con people into thinking he was a competent man to be the sheriff. And of course, he knew that being a sheriff would give him a perfect cover for whatever he wanted to do in the illegal line. Boys, we got a stage leaving Bannock in two days. It's full of gold, and I want that stage. No passengers? No survivors. Plumber's targets of choice were miners trying to transport their gold to a major railhead. Put your hands up, boys! We want the gold! During a four-month period in 1863, it is estimated that Henry Plummer and the road agents killed more than 120 miners, at the same time stealing gold value today at over $6 million. Yeah. The townsfolk of Bannock, Montana, had no idea that their chief law enforcement officer was in reality the ringleader of the road agents. For eight months, Henry Plummer's secret identity remained hidden. Here he is, right out here, boys. Look at that, they drug the hide right off of it. Finally, in December of 1863, an incident in Bannock put the first crack in Plummer's carefully constructed facade. A well-liked young man was cruelly murdered by the road agent gang. One of the local ranchers found the body and brought it into town. And that was enough for them. They formed a posse. And during the next six weeks, the vigilantes worked picking people up, giving them a trial. And uh, we know they hanged about 22 men at least. The vigilantes tracked down the outlaws. Each of them fingered others. The vigilante posse, armed with their new information, rounded up the rest of the gang, dispensing rough justice through makeshift trials. Finally, when a road agent named Red Yeager was about to be hanged, he dropped a bombshell, naming Henry Plummer as the gang's ringleader. Yeager's the one that spilled the beans. But of course, when a man's faced with a noose, he has second thoughts about a lot of things. According to one account, he said, it looks like you're gonna hang me, boys. But if you do, I know a lot of others that deserve it as much as I do. I want you all to know that Henry's the one that planned all this. 
He's the one to run all the road agents. He's the man you want. And that was the first firm indication that Henry Plummer was the leader of the gang. The vigilante posse immediately went to Plummer's house. He named you as the leader of the road agent. Red Jaeger's a liar! Plummer wasn't given a full-scale trial because they had Red Jaeger's confession and the list of the outlaws, so they didn't waste time with the trial. On January 12, 1864, only seven months after the road agents had begun their reign of terror, Henry Plummer was marched to a scaffold he himself had built in his role as sheriff. Before the vigilante posse could hang him, Plummer made an unusual request. I know I've deceived you boys. I'm sorry for that. Well, give me two hours and a horse, and I'll bring back my weight in gold. We made that mistake once. We're going to hang you. Henry Plummer died without benefit of a trial leaving obscure hints of buried treasure as his only legacy. Immediately after Plummer died, a new kind of gold fever hit the Montana Territory. Instead of looking for gold nuggets, prospectors looked for Plummer's buried treasure. In the early 1900s, two mysterious gold hunters found something. Local historian Luke, Jim Edwards recounts the story. One day, they came into the town of Ennis, and they had this box. They went into a local store that had a vault and asked if they could leave this box in there all night. And one of the men stayed there riding shotgun on the vault. The next morning, they disappeared. Nobody knew who they were, where they went, or what they dug up. Of course, nobody at the time thought much about plumber's gold. I don't know that it was, but they dug something up. Even if one box of plumber's gold was removed, much more might remain. Two local men, Scott Jones and Bill Jappy, have been hunting the treasure for nearly five years. They are confident that Plummer's gold still lies buried somewhere in the Montana hills. I think he put enough money in different getaway routes that, you know, it's probably worth some worth finding. The gold has to be there. Because Plummer was the outlaw leader, so he would have had control of the gold. Nobody would bury all their eggs in one basket. He was sheriff of both towns at the same time. So it's understandable that he has it someplace where he has access yeah, to it. I bet there's a 1,000 pounds or better in different places, maybe, from Virginia City to Bannock. Is Henry Plummer's treasure, $6 million worth of nuggets and gold dust, still hidden in the stark Montana hills? That is a question that may never be answered. Only the men who buried it can be certain of its exact location. And they, too, lie buried somewhere in the Montana countryside. In 1954, the historical town of Bannock was placed under the protection of Montana's Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. That means anyone without a special permit is barred from digging for gold on the state-controlled land. But since no one knows exactly where Henry Plummer might have hidden his gold, the search 126 years later still goes on. Next, the story of Jim, Tammy, and Leanne, three inseparable children pulled apart by adoption. 18 years have passed, and today, Leanne wants to see her brother and sister again. Our next story is one of lost love, a woman searching for her half-brother and sister. Sadly, she hasn't seen them since they were only five and seven years old. The clues that remain are a few photographs in this small reel of home movies. Movies of herself and her little brother and sister playing with other children at the beach. Even though more than 19 years have passed since this film was shot, watch closely. Perhaps you know where these children are. This is Jimmy. In 1970, when these films were made, he was four years old. Today, he is 23. This is Tammy, at two years old. Today, Tammy is 22. And finally, this is Leanne. When the home movies were made, she was 11. Today, she is 32. 
Leanne has not seen Jimmy and Tammy since 1972. I never let a year go by where I didn't make some kind of effort to find them. I can't see any reason in this world why we should be separated, why we shouldn't be together. They are my brother and sister. And uh, I'm going to keep searching until I find them. Do you want to go to the park today? Yeah. OK. We can meet the salt over there? Yeah. In 1971, Leanne lived with Jimmy and Tammy in Carson, California, a working class suburb of Los Angeles. How about soup for lunch? Does that sound good? There you go. Their mother, Doris, had cancer. So at 13, Leanne virtually ran the household. Hi, Mom. How are you feeling? I'm feeling a little better. Doris and her first husband, who was Leanne's father, had divorced seven years earlier. I just remember her losing weight and um, getting skinny and being tired a lot. And um, she'd cry and tell me that she was sorry, but I needed to you know, be home with uh, Tammy and Jimmy. Their next door neighbor, Ellen Morrill, was a constant source of support. On her deathbed, Doris asked Ellen if she would promise to take care of Leanne, Jimmy, and Tammy. She just asked me to take her kids, and I told her that I would, because I loved her children. They were easy to love, they were, and they got along fine with mine. They were uh, all like brothers and sisters. And so she uh, put it on a, on a piece of paper that uh, uh, I would take her children and keep them together. And, uh, and then she just lasted a few more hours. Come on, kids. Doris died the next day. Leanne, Jimmy, and Tammy moved in with Ellen and her children. Ellen was great. She took care of all five of the, the children, you know, and me. I can really appreciate it now because at that time she was. 27 or 28 and uh, I was little so I thought of her as old you know and now I'm 31 and I think God how did she do it with six children in a two-bedroom house life was hectic the children seemed happy <laughs> nevertheless a social worker assigned to the case decided that Ellen could not provide an adequate home for Leanne Jimmy and Tammy Leanne, hello. come on kids go in the back Excuse me. Hey. Sorry. Come on, let's go. The social worker tracked down Leanne's father and began to look for a couple to adopt Jimmy and Tammy. Oh, good. Excuse the mess. Okay. We've heard from Leanne's father, and he wants to take her. And you know he's in Texas. But he does not want to take Jim and Tammy. I promised Doris, and it was our agreement that I would keep... I remember together. feeling immediately that I was going to, you know, run away or I was going to take Tammy and Jimmy. There was just no way I was going to have us be separated. But they talked to me and told me that how much sense it made that Tammy and Jimmy needed to have a father figure, that Ellen really couldn't financially take care of us, and what about our future? And I remember doing everything I needed to do to, be, to leave, and it was a... I believe it was a Monday morning because I remember the kids going to school. I want you guys to know that I'll be going away for a little while, okay? I don't want you to go. I don't want you to go. Oh, but I promise we'll keep in touch and I'll be back, okay? I love you both. Come here. Even at that moment, I was thinking, I can't do this. I've got to stay. I wanted to fight, but I thought if I just be good and do what everybody tells me to do, then I'll be able to, you know, reunite with them. And it won't have to be very long. And I still remember them walking down the sidewalk. And I remember hugging them and waving at them and um, telling them I'd be back. And, and then I'd call them. It didn't even register to me that they would be, be put under adoption, meaning that I would never know who they went to or, you know, where they went. Several months later, on May 2nd, 1972, the Department of Social Services arranged to have Jimmy and Tammy picked up by a couple they had chosen to adopt the two children. It was very, very hard uh, because I, I loved them. And uh, my, my children loved them too. But it was, it was best. And uh, I remember them getting into their car and I knew that I'd never see him again. 
I remember seeing them through the back window, you know, and they waved through the back window. That's the last I saw their little faces in the, in the window. For years, Leanne tried to write to Jimmy and Tammy through the adoption agency, but she never received an answer. Thirteen years passed. During that time, Leanne moved back to California, married and became a successful businesswoman. Finally, in 1987, she received a letter from the Department of Social Services containing details about the couple who had adopted Jimmy and Tammy. They were both 26 years old, a Catholic couple living in Ventura County, California. The adoptive father was a career Navy man who in 1973 had the rank of first class petty officer. The couple had been married for three and a half years when they adopted Jimmy and Tammy, but the agency lost touch after the family was transferred to New York in 1976. Eighteen years have passed since I've seen Tammy and Jimmy, and when I look through my home movies, I can really see um, our life together. I felt like I lost a lot back there, and that um, Tammy and Jimmy are, uh, it's, it's completion, it's, a, it's my family. Um, it's also important for me to find them so that they know the truth about how much I love them, how much mom loved them, how much Ellen loved them. They won't know that unless I find them. The children's mother was Doris Marguerite Beard, born in Austin, Texas. She died on May the 5th, 1971. Jimmy's birthday is February the 6th, 1966. Today he is 23 years old. His given name is James Arthur. Tammy's birthday is August 25th, 1967, and she is 22. Her given name is Tamara Christina. Their family name is not known. Just minutes after her story aired, Leanne Robinson's search came to an end when she received a call at our telecenter from her 22-year-old sister, Tammy. Tammy, who lives in Maine and has two children of her own, immediately put Leanne in contact with her brother, Jim, an Army sergeant stationed near Monterey, California. On December 10th, just four days after our show aired, Jim and Tammy arrived at Leanne's home in Los Angeles, California, and met their older sister for the first time in more than 17 years. Oh, I can't even tell you. <laughs> I just had a really good feeling that they, somebody was gonna call in, either they were or somebody that knew them. And today when I first saw them, and I felt so close to him. It felt like the 17 years just came together, and then it was just a few days ago that we last saw each other. <laughs> but Tammy, the biggest surprise came when she phoned our telecenter and discovered that Leanne was there waiting for the call. A lady came to the phone, she says, hello. And I said, hello, I said, who's this? And she goes, this is Leanne. And I was too excited to cry. I was just too excited to, to do anything. I said, oh my God, Leanne. I said, this is Tammy. And um, I, I don't even remember what we said. The first thing I think I remember her saying was that she loved me. This is the happiest time of my life. And I just feel like we're so young. You know, they're 22 and 23, and I'm 32. We have a whole life ahead of us, and we're all healthy. and. We're very fortunate that we could find each other. For every mystery, there is someone, somewhere, who knows the truth. Perhaps it's you.